Good morning and welcome to lesson 12 of this course on PID control. So as usual before starting the course we will review the instruction objectives and these are firstly that we will be related we will be we will learn how to define the related parameters of PID control in an industrial context. Secondly, we will describe and explain in detail about a phenomenon which uh, many times occurs with PID control known as integrated wind up and the ways of reducing that. We will describe various ways of implementing the derivative control part. We will also describe the uh, one technique of you know bumpless auto manual transfer that is when the uh, control is transferred from auto to manual or manual to auto how, so that it can happen without any shock to the process. And finally, we will describe digital implementations of PID control. So, in, in other words, we are going to look at various practical aspects of PID control today. So, let us begin with the PID equation. This is the PID equation which we have seen in the last lesson also where K p is the proportional gain or sometimes we uh, this is not proportional band as written, but uh, it is uh, it is proportional gain we will but a very similar parameter called proportional band is also used in the context of PID controllers. We will see soon how it is related to the proportional gain. Next is the parameter T i, the parameter T i here which is called the reset time and expressed in a peculiar sounding unit called minutes per repeat. Next is the derivative time the derivative time here not not the not the time units of minutes these are uh, rather unusual it may seem rather unusual but remember that typical chemical processes have time constant of the order of minutes so these times are often expressed in minutes this is as very well known control scientist <coughs> carl johan astrom says a, a so called textbook version of the pid control equation as we will see in this in this lesson that there are various modifications that you have to do to this equation before it can be implemented. So, uh, let us first go about defining the various terms. So, we first define proportional gain or proportional band. Proportional gain is well known it is K p which is uh, delta u by delta e or u by e while proportional band this term is new and it is defined in just the inverse way. So, proportional band is defined as it is the band of error which in a hundred which uh, causes which which causes a hundred percent variation in the controller output and generally expressed as a percentage of the range of measurement. So, that is the definition. So, it is in an inverse way where gain is u by e here we are defining p v as the band of error which causes a hundred percent variation in the in the uh, controller output or the manipulated input to the plant right. So, in that sense it is a it is the inverse of k p. So, look at this this diagram will clarify matters further. So, uh, here look at the controller input and suppose this is the set point currently the set point is set here. Okay. So, if the measurement or the output is the measurement or the output could be anywhere in this zone. So, for so it will cause various kinds of error and if you use a proportional band then as the error will increase 
the output will increase. In this case, the, the proportional controller actually has a 50 percent bias, which means that when the error is 0, there is still a 50 percent output, output of the controller. Sorry, this line is getting, so this is typically set at 50 percent. So, there is a, so the controller output equation is actually given as u is equal to k p into e plus, uh, uh, plus a constant term, so plus a constant term c and this constant term is actually 50 percent. So, when the e is 0, still you get 50 percent output because otherwise there will always be a steady state error as we have seen in the last lesson. So, what happens is that as the error changes to this side or to this side, the, the output decreases or increases and if the error changes from here, from here to here, the input to the plan increases from 0 percent to 100 percent. So, this is the band of error which causes the causes an output a, a variation in the controller output from 0 percent to 100 percent and this is the proportional band, right. So, look at let us look at an example. So, while k p is delta u by delta e, proportional band is defined as 100 percent by k p. So, you can easily find out that this gives the error in percentage, which will cause a, 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 a 100 percent input change. Obviously, a narrow k p means a low value of k p implies a high value of k p, uh, a, a narrow p b or a low value of the proportional band implies a high proportional gain, right. So, let us look at an example. Suppose the we are we are we are talking about a temperature control loop where the full scale measurement is 50 degree centigrade, right. Suppose an error of 2 degree centigrade which is 4 percent of 50 degree centigrade causes an input change by 100 percent. So, maybe there is a heater whose output will change from 0 watt to 5000 watts or 1000 watts or whatever. So, if the error changes by 2 degree centigrade, then the heater output will change from 0 percent to 100 percent. So, in such a case, 4 percent change in error causes a 100 percent change in input. So, the proportional band in this case is 4 percent. So, this is the meaning of the proportional band. Now, let us look at the integral gain, which is again expressed in terms of the integral time and the proportional band. Now, here uh, uh, I would, you might think that why is it, why is it that rather than expressing the integral gain, rather than expressing the integral gain as k i, why I am expressing it as k p into t i why the derivative gain which I could call k d, I am I am expressing as k p into t d. What is the what is the reason? The reason is that the reason is actually embedded in history. It turns out that in the older you know uh, hydraulic and pneumatic PID controllers, the construction of the controller was such that one part of the device used to control k p, another part of the device used to control t i, another part of the part of the device used to control t d. So, there are certain distinct parts of the controller which used to realize these terms k p t i and t d. So, that an average, so that an overall integral gain of k p by t i and an overall derivative gain of k p into t d is realized. So, it is for from that principle that the integral time and the derivative time terms are continuing, but, but if you have a if you if you have a microprocessor based controller then then all these terms need not be considered and you could equivalently work with uh, you know k i and k d. But still, let's since I mean, uh, 
since the terminology still continues, so let us see the meanings because ki and kd we understand very well, they are just simply the gain terms. So let us see what is integral time. So integral time is the time taken to repeat the proportional control effort or action for a step error signal. So what happens is that let us, this is probably not so clear, so let us look at the, let us look at the scenario. So, so now suppose take this as a, this is a PI controller, right? This is a PI control, controller. Suppose we are giving a step error signal to it. So here we have a, I am sorry, so here we have a step input. If you give a step input like this, like this to the controller, then how will the u output vary? The u output will, will vary like this. So immediately the kp part will rise. So this will be kp into e and then the integral term will start integrating the error. So it will go up, right? And after some time, after some time, this integral part of the input will equal the proportional part of the input. So, the, so <coughs> it turns out that after exactly after ti amount of time, the input will become, if, if the proportional control input is kp, because I have taken the error as unity, then after ti amount of time, the total input will become 2 kp or the integral part will repeat the proportional part. So in that sense, this definition is now explained, that is time taken, this time taken to repeat the proportional control effort action for a step error signal, okay? And it is given as, as we all know, it is given as kp by ti. The proportional, the integral gain is expressed as kp by ti. Now, so from this definition, perhaps it is now clear why it is expressed as minutes per repeat. So for, if the, if this continues, then every ti minutes the integral term will produce another kp times input, right? So, the, so the proportional control it will continuously repeat every ti minutes. In that sense, the unit is minutes per repeat. So that is the that explains the integral term. Now we go to the uh, derivative term. Again, we have a derivative gain and we have a derivative time. So again, now the derivative time is the time taken for the proportional term to equal the derivative term for a ramp error signal. So again, a similar thing. So let us look at the diagram here. So here now we have a PD controller, right? So in the PD controller, if you feed it a ramp signal now, let us say a ramp signal of some, of some slope E dot some slope e dot, then immediately what will be the, what will be the, now that, now the, now the derivative term will jump because there is a constant e dot. So there will be immediately a kd into e dot term and the kp term will now start going up because e is going up. So <coughs> after td time, this is going to be kp e dot into td. So if kp e dot into td has to equal kd into e dot, which is the derivative term output, then kd equal to kp into td. So this is the time, this is the time or this is the derivative time after which the proportional action will repeat the derivative action. So that explains what is the meaning of the term derivative time. Now we come to the implementation of the PID controller. And, and we basically we are trying to see that what are the problems that might occur if you just simply implement the term as a proportional as an in plus integral plus derivative. So first we look at the integral term in detail and see what happens when there is actuator saturation. Now you see actuator saturation is actually very common in the sense that uh, only in certain cases, see the set point keeps on varying. So suppose the suppose the set point stays suppose the set point stays uh, 
80 percent of the time it stays in about 60 percent of its maximum value and probably at 5 percent of the time it reaches something like it reaches 100 percent. Now, if you have to make an, in, an actuator which can really deliver full output even for a 100 percent control input completely proportional, then the, then the actuator has to be very large and the, and the actuator setting has to be, I mean the actuator power rating has to be very large. So, often it is, it is very common that okay, we will, we will choose an actuator which can deliver input proportional to the control input for about 70, 75 percent and then it will saturate. So, the cases where you will you will get, you are going to give uh, very rare cases sometimes very exceptional cases maybe you will give more than 75 or 80 percent at that time there will be some error and you are willing to tolerate it. So, this happens in many cases. Now, so we, we want to see what happens to the PID controller in such cases of actuator saturation. So, let us look at this case very carefully. So, you see that suppose the maximum possible output that the actuator can produce is this. So, here it saturates, so it cannot produce any further output, but a set point is given which is higher than that. So, the actuator naturally cannot give enough input corresponding to this set point. So, what will happen is that the output will rise and then here it will saturate it cannot, so the output cannot increase beyond this point and this amount of error, this amount of error will, will, increase, will exist, this is the steady state error which will exist. One cannot do anything about it simply because whatever control you apply the actuator will not be able to give input, so the plant input will not increase beyond this, that is fine. Now, suppose the set point is reduced, here it is you have realized that it cannot reach that set point, so it is reduced. So, immediately now, now this output level, this output level is very much reachable by the actuator. So, what is desirable is that the actuator will immediately, because by control action the output will come down and will reach a 0 steady state error point as is common under the, uh, under integral control, but exactly that does not happen. Why it does not happen? Now, suppose that you have held this error, you have not immediately reduced it, but you have continued with it for some time. So, now what is happening here? During this time, the, prop the error is constant, the error is constant. So, the proportional term, so the proportional uh, part of the control input remains constant, but the integral term of the control input goes on increasing. So, the integral in the PID controller goes on integrating the error. However, it cannot produce a control input because the actual that input is given. So, the as if the PID controller output is the controller output is continuously increasing, it is also coming to the actuator input, but the actuator is not able to give that output because it is already saturated. Now, suppose that after some time the, the control input is now reduced. Now, what is going to happen? What will be observed is that the while the while it, it would have been desirable that the control input immediately falls down and reaches, a, reaches the desired steady state point, it does not do that. Rather, it continues at the same level, ignoring that the that the that the set point has now been reduced, and only after some time, only after some time does the actuator does the control start to respond to the set to the set point. Now, this phenomenon is called integrator wind up. Basically, what has happened is that the integrator has become bloated or floated. So, it has not realized that it, that the plant cannot reach this output, so the error is, is will persist. So, it is unnecessarily trying to give more and more control input and getting blown up, right. So, that is integrator wind up and it happens essentially because of the fact that see during, during the time when the error is persisting say from this point 
the error is persisting. So, the proportional input is remaining constant, but the, but the integral input is, is growing. So, suppose at this time it has reached this value, now the set point is reduced. So, it is at this point that the set point is reduced. Now, what is going to happen and, and this is the saturated output. So, the integral is way beyond the saturated level. So, now that it is re, the set point is reduced, now the error is become negative. So, the integral value is now reducing, but still it is positive. See at this point, at this point the control input is still greater than the saturated level. So, what goes is actually this level and therefore, the output persists. So, only at this time after so much time does it come to the below the saturated input level and then it goes further below. So, the, so, from this point onward the output will start reducing. So, this is what happens. So, this is so the whole idea is that the integral should not be allowed to blow up and continuously blow up with time if the if the uh, oh sorry if the error persists due to a phenomenon like actuator saturation. So, this, so that is precisely that can be done in many ways and uh, here is here is uh, one here is the scheme one scheme one of many possible schemes which will realize that. So, how do we do that? So, look at this controller simple controller we have we have the usual p d the the derivative term which you can ignore for the time for the time being it is not concerned. So, we have a proportional term which is coming we also have a derivative term which is coming which we did not consider any in this slide. So, what is happening here is that here actually it is here suppose this is the actuator right. So, the actuator has a saturation characteristic. So, even if this is the controller output and this is the plant input in between sits the actuator. So, what you are doing is you are actually sensing the physical plant input. You could either do that or you could have an have, have a model of the actuator in the controller itself and check before giving the input check whether this is really going to cross the actuator limit. So, you can either do it in software or you can use a sensor to again see what uh, input is going. Now, when V becomes larger than U then you are sub and then, then this actuation error becomes negative. Now, what you want to do is now you, you take this actuation error and you feed it. So, here a negative term is coming and here error is positive. So, through the PID integral term a positive term is coming. So, you have to define this gain in a suitable manner such that whenever V this becomes negative this signal becomes 0, this signal becomes 0. So, when this signal becomes 0, this integrator does not build up. So, this integrator output remains at constant value. So, you see that whenever you, you are giving an input which is going to cause an actuator saturation, the this but special path which we have added to the PID controller will now prevent, will now prevent the integral term from blowing up. So, that when the set point is reduced, the plant output will follow very smoothly right. So, this is the scheme this is one of the schemes which can be used for anti reset wind up sometimes integral wind up is also called reset wind up. So, uh, coming to the next one now as I was telling that PID controllers uh, were historically many of them were made if using hydraulic and pneumatic devices. So, they used to have you know certain realization structures. So, this is a typical structure where you know as I as I said that you know one part one part of the controller used to be realized used to realize the gain typically you know devices like flapper nozzles which we will see and there are there are various kinds of you know bellows or orifices constrictions which are used to to realize these these time constants. So, the controller structure look at this structure. So, if you realize this for the time being let us forget about this one assume that it is it goes directly it is 1. So, if you take this structure then you will find that uh, 
you will find that what is the if you compute the transfer function between u and v if you compute the transfer function between u and v first of all note that there is that is uh, ki is is realized as kp by ti so there is interaction this is called an interactive mode because if you change the proportional gain kp then the integral gain ki also changes so whenever you change kp if you want to keep the integral gain constant you have to also change ki so the various parameters cannot be varied in a non interactive mode but they must they will be interacting okay and the transfer function between v and u ignoring the limiter this is a limiter that is if if the value goes beyond a certain value it will limit it if it goes below a certain value it will also limit it so if you ignore the limiter for the time being then you will find that the transfer function between u and v is given as 1 plus 1 by sti so when you multiply it by kp you get the transfer function of a pi controller okay so uh, you can also see so so basically what you have realized is the same transfer function that is kp into 1 plus 1 by sti but you have realized it in this way now if you now let us look at the role of the limiter which is also used in this structure to avoid integral wind up so you see that if there is if there is uh, if there is if u goes to high this is actually going to the actuator this is the controller output which is going to the actuator so if this u goes to goes very high then what is going to happen is that this limiter which is inside the controller itself is going to is going to limit this so this u will become constant so when this u becomes constant you can see you, this is a this is a simple first order transfer function so at that point of time this input will also be constant so now what is happening is that the error is the error is constant so therefore this this v is constant and because this u has gone to a high level so even at some level depending on the where you have set the limiter this is also constant so therefore u becomes constant so the output of the pi controller does not build up indefinitely but gets limited so this is another way by which uh, uh, an anti reset wind up scheme can be implemented typically in hydraulic and pneumatic controllers now we will look at a phenomenon another problem which occurs typically with integral control and that happens when you have you know auto manual transfer now let let me first explain this term there are there are there are many most processes will also allow the the operator to give input that is if he if he wants in, in then in certain situations you can bypass the automatic controller and rather using some using some input device like a like, like a potentiometer or a knob or a switch you can give manual input to the plant and you can slowly build it up and then at maybe for some purpose right or and then but but then finally you don't want to run the run the plant manually all the time so you want to switch over to the automatic control now during this switch over problems can occur as we'll see here so here is a case where <coughs> so you see that this is a process this is the actuator and the input to the actuator can come either from the automated pid controller so this is automatic control automatic controller and this is manual so the operator is actually giving some input here and here is a switch here is the switch which you can flick so that the actuator get it gets its input either from the pid controller or from the manual control correct now <coughs> imagine now the the main question is that when i am transferring how do i know for example suppose here the input was let us say 1 volt now how do i know that when i flick this switch to auto i shall i shall also here the the input existing may be 10 volt so now what will happen that previously the actuator was in was in 1 volt was getting an input of 1 volt 
Now, from 1 volt, suddenly a 10 volt output will, suddenly a 10 volt will go to the actuator. So, the actuator, if it is a motor or if it is a valve, it'll, it might get a shock. Similarly, the, the process also will, will get a very, very, will tend to get very high input. So, this shock that is we, we normally try to operate the processes so that we, if we want to increase the input, we, we ramp it up gradually. You do not give an input 1 volt now, 10 volt then again minus 2 volt. So, such inputs are sometimes detrimental to the equipment either in the process or to the, to, or to the actuator equipment. So, the question is, question is how to ensure that the PID output is close to the manual during transfer. In fact, it, it often it is not because of the fact that the PID control remember that its output is not going to the actuator but it is all the time getting both the set point and the measurement. So, it is all the time computing the error, computing its integral, everything it is doing. So, it is quite likely that the PID control output is actually saturated during the time that you are manipulating the process with manual control, it is quite possible that the PID output has got saturated. It is stuck either at its negative maximum or its positive maximum. So now, if you if you sw suddenly flick the switch over, you are likely to give the plant a shock, and we want to avoid that. So 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 how do you avoid that? So for avoiding that, I'm sorry. <coughs> for avoiding that, we rather than giving the input u, we would like to give the input delta u. So you see that this is a clever scheme which avoids that avoids that process. So, you suppose you are in manual control. So, you are every time you are actually giving delta u. So, you are maybe there is a plus minus switch and you are flicking the switch to plus. So, the input is going up every time you are giving positive delta u. If the flicking the switch to minus you are giving negative delta u and this these delta u's are getting integrated here by some device okay, maybe in the actuator. Now, and the PID controller is also not does not give you u, but does give you incremental input delta u every time it computes delta u. How it computes delta u we will see very soon, but suppose the PID control is implemented in a form which is known as the incremental PID form and it gives you delta u, right. So, now, <coughs> now what is going to happen? Now, suppose up to u k minus 1 you were in manual. Now, suddenly in u k just between u k minus 1 to k between the time instance k minus 1 to k you have flicked the switch to on. So, what will happen is that now a u k minus 1 plus delta u k will term will be added to the actuator and this is will come from auto, this will come from the auto mode. But you see that this is actually a delta term, so it is an increment, so it cannot be very large. So, the process will that will get the old manual input plus a little change which is due to auto. So, it will not get a shock. So, gradually these these delta u k s will will build up and will slowly take the process from one input to another input. So, the transfer from auto to manual mode is going to be bump less that is the terminology which is used. Okay. So, these are some problems which you need to con you know I mean take care of when you are trying to implement especially when you are trying to Im implement integral terms. Now, let us come to the derivative term. So, let us look at the first problem with derivatives that is that, that derivatives uh, I am sorry that derivatives typically tend to blow up high frequency noise and where does high frequency noise come from? high frequency noise comes from sensors amongst one thing. For example, typically let us consider some you know a, a flow sensor, you know flow sensor flow is always turbulent. So, you know for the, the fluid actually flows in, in random fashions whenever you have a flow beyond a certain velocity flow is turbulent. So, whatever sensor you now the turbulence induces frequencies which are much higher than the average volumetric flow rate. So, while the average volumetric flow rate may be varying like this, 
the signal that you will get from the sensor may induce very high frequency components. So, the signal these signals are actually due to due to the turbulence. So, this is this gives a noise right. Now, the point is that if you take this signal and if you suppose if you consider the case that consider the case that you have a this point needs to be understood. Suppose you have a signal which goes like this and you on this you have a noise I am drawing actually noise will be much more higher frequency. Now, if you take derivative of this signal what will happen the the derivative of the the derivative of the low frequency original signal will remain will remain positive up to this point will slowly fall and then will become negative here no the the derivative around this is going to be positive then will fall to zero and then become negative what happens to the to the derivative of the other signal see the derivative of the other signal is going to start from positive bit within this short time it will reach a negative maximum and then it will again so it will be it will be widely varying so you see that while these signals are more or less close to each other they are they are their derivative terms are completely different so if you calculate a derivative exact pure derivative then the even a small amount of high frequency noise is going to give you a lot of difference in the control input so so therefore you need to use a derivative which will act like a derivative up to a certain frequency but beyond a certain frequency its gain will not be will not blow up right so we need to limit the gain for high frequency noise so to do that we simply the transfer function of a derivative is s if we now consider the transfer function of the of the signal s by 1 plus t s imagine oh just i need to select the pen so that what is the gain of the so as s varies that is as the frequency varies s by 1 plus t s will at low frequencies this term is small compared to 1 so it acts so it acts like I don't know. Hmm. Okay, so it so 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 it acts like uh, S in this part of the region. While in this part of the region where S is large, then it acts like this. Then it T S is T S is much much greater than one, and therefore this gain becomes equal to one by T. So, this level is 1 by t. So, you see that we have in the lower frequency region we are having a derivative, but in the higher frequency region we are having a constant gain of 1 by t. So, so that is what so that is how you need to you need to realize your derivative. So, so the idea is that for low frequency it is s, for high frequency it is 1 by t. Now, this is also useful for certain kinds of mechanical actuators as I said that if you give a very high frequency signal and then creates derivative then you are going to give it very high frequency positive and negative torques which is not good for a, a, a mechanical actuator like a control valve it, it might damage the valve and as I have given an example that such noise may come from various kinds of measurements especially flow measurements which are very common in, a, in an industrial process. So now we come to the now there is there is there is a second problem associated with the derivative control structure and so far we, as we have seen we have implemented we have we have implemented the PID control like this that is the error term this is the error term the error term goes here gets multiplied by KP gets multiplied by KI and gets multiplied by KD also. Now as we have seen that we want to avoid giving shocks to the process right. So, what happens when you in many cases the set point is changed like a step. 
So, if you change the step, what is going to happen to the error? It is also going to change like a step. So, then what will happen to the to the derivative output here? It is going to be at this time, it is going to rise very much and then it is going to fall to 0. So, you are going to give a shocking input to the plant if you put the derivative here. So, now the question is that how can I avoid such shocks, but if the if r is not changed, if when r is constant, if there is if 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 y changes due to various other factors like disturbances, we I need to keep the uh, derivative control. I don't want to sacrifice derivative control. I want to have it, except for the instance where r changes like a step. So a clever way of doing that is by realizing that when r is constant. D e by r is equal to or rather uh, e is equal to r minus y. So, so d e by d t is equal to when r is constant it is minus of d y by d t. So, rather than having d by d t here, here I can also take y here and then change the sign and, and implement the same block here. So, when r is not changing I am going to get the same effect as d e by d t. But when r is r goes a, goes through a step, there is there is absolutely no effect here. So so during that time, it'll it'll simply slowly rise, and I mean corresponding effect you will get as y rises, you will again getting get the PD effect, but this shock will not come. So this is something which is to be remembered when a derivative control is to be implemented. Now we come to the last topic that is the digital realizations because nowadays most controllers are actually implemented using microprocessors. So, how do we write implement the PID equation in a in a in a microprocessor? So, that is very simple that is <coughs> we uh, we do a do we do what is known as a discretization. In other words, the integral we simply replaced by a sum. So, we say that in a, in a digital controller we can compute inputs at certain instants of time. So, if t is that those instants of time are called sampling instance. So, at the kth sampling instant where the time value is equal to k of t, k into t, the, the input is again consists of three terms that is the proportional value at k t, the integral value at k t and the derivative value at kt. Now, the question is how do we compute this proportional integral and derivative terms. So, the proportional controller is simply p k t is equal to k p into e k t. So, we just sample the equation. The integral controller is the integral is actually realized by a what is known as a trapezoidal integration right not even not even trapezoidal this is this is you know uh, what is called uh, uh, backward difference integration, right. So, what we are doing is that we simply assume that since e k t is going to be constant over that over the time interval k minus 1 to k. So, the integral, so we want to actually what oh, okay. So, what we are doing is that basically we are doing that simple thing that if if this is e k t this is e k minus 1. and this is e k, then after we get e k what is going to be the integral and this is e k plus 1, that is the error is decreasing like this. So, between e k and e k to e k minus 1 that is between rather k t to k plus 1 t. I assume that this error is going to be maintained. So, the integral will rise simply as a as a, as a rectangle. So, I write, so I multiply this this integral I realize by multiplying e k t by t. So, that will be the integral and then I add it with my previous value of the integral to get the present value of the integral. Similarly, the the, the derivative term we make a simple bring this t here. So, then you get this is an this is a basically an approximation of y dot t. So, basically I construct 
I have to construct approximations of the derivative of y and integrals of y using samples. So, that is what we do. And this implementation form is often called a position form. So, it is called a position form because the whole input u is u is calculated. Now, as we have seen that in some cases it is it is rather necessary to generate delta u rather than u as we have seen. Right. So, then now the question is that how do we generate delta u that is called an incremental realization of the PID controller or sometimes called a velocity form. So, what happens in the velocity form we need to compute delta u k t. So, so delta u k t is very simply computed delta u k t is nothing but u k t minus u k minus 1 t. So, we sub just simply substitute the previous formulae of u k t and u k minus 1 t and then subtract. So, what will happen is that see the what, what happens is the proportional term subtraction give this k p into e k t minus e k minus 1 t. Similarly, the integral term is basically i k t minus i k minus 1 t. So, it will give that additional term which I obtained. So, this is the integral integral part of delta u and the derivative part of delta u is this which is basically the difference between this and the same thing at k minus 1. So, so basically by taking a difference of these terms you can generate the generate delta u very simply. So, it is not a difficult problem. And then finally, we have to give u, we cannot give to the plant, finally we have to give u. So, we simply add u k minus delta u k t we have computed. So, we have to simply add u k minus 1 t with that. And there are also some kinds of actuators where uh, let us say like you know uh, step motors where <coughs> the, the, the actuator itself integrates the output. So, 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 this summation you need not you need not give you just give keep on giving the delta u and the and the actuator will gradually move and will will continuously add it. So, in a let us say in a in a position control using some using some uh, let us say stepper motor it, it is it is very convenient to give the delta u's in fact, it is the delta u's which have to be given and so therefore, the PID control has to be implemented in this form. So, as we have seen that there are the there are some disadvantages of this of this incremental realization because of the because of the sample realization and because we in this case we are actually making a second order derivative not a first order derivative because there is also already a deriv derivative term in u and we are making another derivative because we want to compute delta u. So, because of sampling approximations a high amount of noise may be introduced there that needs to be taken care of. So, your sampling interval should be good small enough and the advantages as we have seen is that it is very simply possible to, uh, to give uh, bumpless auto manual transfer and also for some, uh, some actuators it, it, it is what needs to be given. Now, there is an interesting phenomenon that happens is that sometimes generally this this mode is implemented in this form that is a PID controller when there is an integral mode. Basically, because of the fact that if you see the delta u term you will find that one component contains e k min e k minus e k minus 1 that is the proportional component. Now, in this component there is no r there is no that is the that is the reference input does not appear because e k is equal to r k minus y k. Similarly, e k minus 1 is equal to r k minus 1 minus y k minus 1. So, if you subtract and if r is remaining constant then this will get constant and you will simply get y k minus y k mi minus 1 minus y k. So, and the same thing happens to the d mode. So, the p and d in the p and d modes r does not appear. So, the reference input, so even if the in you know even if the output drifts slowly, even if because because r does not appear, 
so it will so the so so the total value of error does not come is not reflected in the in the control input but in the integral term there is an ek term just simply ek so that contains r k that contains r k the, there r k is not cancelled so it is so it is said that generally when you implement digital controllers in, in incremental form you should have an integral mode otherwise the process may slowly drift from set point without the controller taking corrective action so uh, having said that so that brings us to the end of our lesson let us review the lesson once so we looked at the p i and d modes and looked at the various terms their definitions proportional band integral time and derivative time their meanings how they can be measured so and so uh, then we saw that the the these various control modes can give you various kinds of transient and steady state performance for example we have seen that the the integral control mode uh, can cause integral wind ups it can cause integral wind ups similarly we have seen that the derivative control mode can give you a lot of noisy performance if you have sensor noise so some effects of these control modes on on performance are discussed that is these problems with d and i modes we have discussed and finally we have discussed also a digital realization now let's look at some you know points to ponder whose answer again just like earlier lessons you will find within this presentation itself if you look carefully so you might like to write yourself the definition of proportional bands integral derivative times it is you would like to explain the, uh, the the factors that cause integral wind up so integral wind up is basically caused by basically caused by two factors so what are those factors and we have discussed in this lecture two control architectures which will avoid integral wind up so how to avoid that and then we have seen that while you are implementing derivative control you have to take care of two points such that you don't add unnecessary disturbances and shocks to the plant so what are they and finally we have seen that a pid controller may be realized in what is known as a position form and a velocity form so you need to think how to distinguish between them when which one is required and also what is a bumpless transfer and, and how it is achieved so the answers to these questions are exist in many textbooks and also within the within this lecture thank you very much today Good morning. So today we are going to have lesson 13 of the course, which is on PID controller tuning. As we will see that controller tuning is a very important uh, phase of the overall controller design and it very critically determines the performance of the control loop which in turn affects the overall quality of the product affects cost so it's a very important <coughs> uh, method to be learned in the uh, in the overall context of industrial automation so so before we get into the business proper let us first see 
uh, what are the instructional objectives of the core of the of the lesson as is the usual practice. So, as we state in every lesson after learning the lesson the student should be able to firstly state guideline for selection of controller types. When I said PID controller I actually mean a class that is the three classes of controllers that is P control, PI control and PID control which are most often used in the context of industrial automation. So, the student should be able to select one of these types then you can say that ok even if during this period I have some error and my control performance is may be affected depending on whether I have if I have an integral error criterion then it will be less affected because this positive error is going to cancel this negative error. But even then I am able to tolerate this much of error because after because it is going to die down reasonably fast for me and then it will stay on for a long long time right. So, in such a case so in other words the this interval is actually small which means that the that the open loop dynamics is actually fast enough it is fast enough compared to what compared to the frequency of uh, set point change and so that the closed loop transient response is actually acceptable. Typical example is flow control. Points to ponder for you or is that you can try to find out in, in what situations P, PI and PID controllers are to be used. All the answers are in this lecture only and you can try to find out your own examples of processes. And then uh, under what conditions you can find under what conditions one can apply a, a direct synthesis procedure let us say in your application processes whether you can apply or not or if you can apply why why you can apply or why you cannot apply all these things. You can also cite two advantages and disadvantages of open loop method against the closed loop method and finally, you can you can find under what situation and an auto tuning feature will be needed and how is it achieved how is it how an auto tuning is achieved one procedure is already given in the lecture. So, here we end, thank you very much.